Have you ever wanted to be a Jedi? Many Star Wars games let you play as one, but it never quite captures the feeling of being one. Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy was the only game that did that. I played this game all the way back in 2003 as a small child and fell in love with it. It was the only game I have ever played that let you truly feel like a Jedi. It's been almost 20 years since then and I wanted to come back to it. Not just to replay it, but to do an analysis on everything it has to offer. There will be spoilers about the story and I will only be talking about the single player campaign. Before we get started, we have to create our character. There's a selection of 6 choices, 3 male and 3 female. There's only 2 viable choices here. For male characters, it's Keldor, because Plo Koon was your favorite character from Clone Wars. For female, it would be Twi'lek, because Aayla Sakura was your favorite character in Battlefront 2, or you just want to stare at them blue legs. We also get to customize our own lightsaber. The saber hilts have some iconic ones available, like Anakin's lightsaber or Obi-Wan's lightsaber. We conclude by picking a lightsaber color and begin with the campaign. Let's greet the opening crawl. It's been 10 years since the return of the Jedi. The New Republic is fighting the last of the Imperial Remnants that are still operating. Luke Skywalker opens a new Jedi Academy on the planet Yavin 4 and we're one of his new recruits. We are Jaden Kor, a Keldor from Coruscant who built a lightsaber without any Jedi training. We're on a shuttle heading to Yavin 4 and another student, Rosh, starts chatting with us. Rosh comes across like a little stepbrother. He's annoying and is always trying to compete with you. He'll be serving as our friend slash rival for the story. Our shuttle gets shot down by an unseen foe and we're forced to make an emergency landing which dumps us into the tutorial level. Here we're taught the basic movement, how to jump, crouch, and swing our lightsaber. Lightsaber combat is more than just left click to attack. Your attacks are tied to your movement. Moving forward and backward will cause Jaden to swing the lightsaber vertically. Moving side to side will swing the lightsaber horizontally. Diagonal will swing the lightsaber in a diagonal direction. The mechanics are similar to Devil May Cry's combat mechanics, even including combos tied to your button presses. For example, to perform a rolling stab, you need to press W to move forward, C to crouch, and left click to attack. Or, for a cartwheel, you need to run to the side and jump while attacking. This causes Jaden to perform a cartwheel swing in his lightsaber. We'll talk more about this later, just keep in your mind that your movement is king in this game. If your movement is great, you're going to feel like a badass Jedi. If your movement is lacking, you're going to be dying a lot to gravity. Our reticle controls our movement direction, and where we swing our lightsaber. Now this reticle isn't the most reliable in the game. It is inaccurate to what you're aiming at. Look at this right here. There's a howler in front of me and I'm throwing my lightsaber right at it. It visibly passes through its neck and should get decapitated. But it doesn't. Even when the reticle turns red, my lightsaber should be hitting it. But the howler's hitbox is actually lower than what the game is telling the player. I found that if you crouch when you throw your lightsaber, it will improve your accuracy. Which is ironic since crouching doesn't improve accuracy at all for the guns. Let's progress through the tutorial. Rosh is trapped on the other side of this stream. He could simply just jump down from it, but Rosh is like Hiati Mundi, grossly incompetent but thinks he's the best there is. We cut a tree down for him. Fight some howlers. They're called that because they howl, if you couldn't guess that. We're blocked by a locked door, with a switch to open it behind a gate. Rosh uses force pull on the object. This teaches the player that using force pull works on switches out of reach, but this mechanic is never necessary in the whole game. Rosh then exclaims this. I'm a great Jedi! Which made me laugh because he didn't land a single shot on any of the howlers before this. We're about to make it to the Jedi Temple when we spot some stormtroopers. Rosh tells us to go fight them alone since we have a lightsaber and all he has is a blaster and the force. But whatever, we cut them down, and out of nowhere, a Sith apprentice jumps over and attacks us. He's our first taste of saber dueling in Jedi Academy. <laughs> it's chaotic, fast-paced, and you and your opponent can die quickly from just one bad misstep. It's not elegant combat by any means, but it's also the most fun you'll have in any game with lightsaber combat. There's something about the sword fights that just make it so satisfying. 
Maybe it's the constant dance between you and your opponent trying to land just a single blow on each other, weaving in and out of each other's attacks, jumping around, throwing lightning at them. It's just pure chaos. On the other hand, lightsaber duels can be this long battle of attrition of managing your HP and force points until it ends abruptly when the Sith cultist overshoots his jump and falls to his death. We strike down our dark side aggressor and move to investigate the temple. We see a woman channeling a laser beam on the Jedi temple. She hears us and blasts us with the beam, knocking us out. What? <laughs> Jaden awakes to Luke Skywalker in original character Kyle Katarn from the Dark Force series. He's going to be our Jedi Master, and Rosh's Master too. Kyle takes us to a training course to teach us our different Force powers. Force Jump lets you jump higher and perform acrobatics. Force Pull pulls object, Force Push pushes objects, and Force Speed, quote, increases our movement speed, end quote. In reality, it slows down all the enemies you see and puts a trail effect behind you. It's a clever trick implemented by the developers of Jedi Academy. The developers also implemented rain on this level. A small cool detail is you see the rain evaporate from the lightsaber's intense heat. It's small details like these that truly enhances the immersion of Jedi Academy. The visuals aren't anything grand like in Halo 1, but what is here works to great effect. My favorite two examples are this train level here. You're on a high speed train moving through a city. You're seeing buildings pass by you rapidly. Jaden puts his arm up to shield himself from the wind, and when you're outside you see the train shaking, but when you go inside everything is still. On the planet Coruscant, there's buildings everywhere with all these lights on them. You also see flying cars if you look below, and the sky is filled with a crescent moon. All these small details make you feel like you're in the Star Wars universe instead of it just feeling like a standard video game level. Commencing Tatooine invasion. Back to the tutorial. Rosh releases a training droid against us to slow us down since he wants to finish before us. We beat it since we're the best Jedi ever and make it to the end. Kyle Katarn gives Rosh a slap on the wrist for him almost killing us and then proceeds to tell us not to be upset at him since anger leads to the dark side. Star Wars Jedi Academy has a three act structure. In each act, you'll have five missions available for you to choose. You only need to complete four of them to move on to the next act. But I would recommend against it. You see, each mission you do allows you to upgrade a force power of your choosing. There's light side with force absorption, force heal, mind trick, and force protection. The difference being that force absorption protects you from the enemy force attacks, which you'll need if you're playing on Jedi Master since the enemies like to spam life drain on you, which drains both your HP and your force points. Force protection reduces the damage taken from blaster bolts to lightsaber attacks. You'll need this too if you want to live through the fights without getting one shot since enemy attacks can deal a lot of damage on this difficulty. Cool fact, if you use both force absorption and protection at the same time, your aura changes to a unique color. For dark side powers, you got force choke, force lightning, life drain, which lets you suck, and lastly, you have dark rage, which drains your HP in exchange for increased damage, damage resistance, and immunity from death for its duration. The first two missions in Act 1 take place on Tatooine. Because it wouldn't be a Star Wars if he didn't visit this godforsaken planet again. I think it's a law George Lucas wrote for Star Wars. But before we begin, we're given a small bit of context for our objective. For this mission, we're investigating rumors that mercenaries have been hired by the Sith cultists and we need to question them. On the next screen, we get a follow-up task with a talking NPC like Kyle Katarn or Luke Skywalker or even C-3PO. Kyle begins the mission by telling us to stay behind and watch the ship while he goes and listens to some cool cantina music. Time passes and we're interrupted by Chewbacca rolling through the doorway, trying to get away from mercenaries. So now the mission begins with everyone's favorite walking carpet, Chewie. No wonder why this is the first mission listed for players. It serves as fan service and Chewbacca assists new players getting used to combat. Chewie is placed here to help new players not feel overwhelmed by the amount of enemies that you'll be fighting. New players don't know the limits of Jaden's combat effectiveness yet. One criticism I have with this level is that it is easy to get turned around in here. 
Jedi Academy has the problem of not telling what doors actually open or are placed for decoration. It doesn't help either that the interiors all look the same with just stacked crates everywhere. At the end, you have a rematch with a Sith Occultite in a saber duel. The area is tight and controlled, and the enemy doesn't use any force powers. It's a good teaching progression for the player. The first time you had the high ground advantage, but this time, you and your opponent are on equal footing. We end the level after everyone is defeated, and Kyle tells us how awesome we are. But this isn't the last of Tatooine. The next level has us going to rescue a droid on a sand crawler. There isn't too much to say about this level. You fight sand people who are more dangerous than you might have anticipated. This level does teach the player about interacting with objects in the world to solve puzzles. You must move these metal boxes with force pull slash push and to scan the environment for dealing with environmental hazards. The lava pools, for example, blocks our path forward. We can't jump the distance without being killed, so we have to shoot a water pipe along the wall to have water come out to solidify the lava. We find the droid and end this mission. Before we jump into the next mission, we're treated to a cutscene back at the Jedi Temple on Yavin. Rosh is complaining that Don't Call Me Master Kyle Katarn doesn't think that Rosh is the best Jedi ever. Rosh believes it's because Kyle wants to hold him back from being the most powerful Jedi. But in actuality, it's just that Rosh is incompetent. I love how when Rosh asks Jaden his opinion here, Jaden sounds like a flustered shy nerd being asked out on a date for the first time. I'm not so sure. What do you think, Jaden? Well, I... Ready to get back out there? Did I interrupt something? Our next mission has us on the planet Bakora. A group of Imperials have taken over a thermal plant that's located above an active volcano. They're planning on blowing the facility up to flood a town near the volcano with lava. There's no complex motive for this act of terrorism, besides them just being evil. Though, if I had to read deeply into it, then the Imperials are doing it to show how weak the New Republic is at protecting its worlds. So, the governments of these planets will get fed up with the New Republic and join the Imperial side. Even though, the Imperials are the terrorists that destroyed their town, which contradicts this entire reasoning, so it all just comes back to it not making too much sense, which is fine. We are introduced to the mechanic of bombs. We'll have a few levels of us disarming bombs or setting up our own bombs. The look of this place is cool though, it sells the look of this location. There's lava being pumped inside this power plant. The plant is also hanging over this volcanic vent. I just wish the designers of this mission added lava at the bottom of this place instead of it just being a bottomless pit. We deactivate all the bombs and brace forward to the next mission. A merchant ship crashed into Blangeal, a planet that sticks out with players because of its opening. Hello? Hello? Hey, you there! Thank the Force you've come! This place is... Uh. <laughs> what was that? This mission is great because it's like you're playing the floor's lava, but instead of lava, it's DUNE! This level serves as our test on platforming. Stay off the sand or get eaten. You can use thermal detonators here to lure the dune worms away from you. Here's an interesting fact about your dear speaker here. When I played this game as a kid, these worms scared me so much that I didn't complete this level. Coming back to it now and beating it makes me feel a lot closer to Jaden. We are both growing in power through our respective acts in life. The level also serves as a nice break from the standard gameplay loot in Jedi Academy of you just clearing levels of enemies. Every act will have a mission that shakes the gameplay up and they're all fantastic. Well, most of them. Moving on, we're sent to stop a runaway train. I still love the small detail on this mission of Jaden putting their arm up to block the wind. It's these small details in Jedi Academy that I cherish and show the passion that developers put into their game. This level makes good use of vertical level design. The level is just a corridor, but having these enemies shoot at you from different elevations keep things interesting. Especially these guys with snipers that can kill you easily. My favorite moment from this level was fighting on top of this breakable glass here. This is the last mission we do in Act 1 before we're called back to the Jedi Temple. During our time we spent doing missions, Luke Skywalker was investigating what all that beam nonsense was from the intro. Turns out that Force Beam is actually used to siphon Force Energy out of locations. Which I still wonder how this works exactly. Maybe the beam is actually just a strong vacuum that collects all the midichlorians in the area. Who knows? 
Luke thinks that the collecting of Force energy must not be good and send us to investigate the planet Hoth because it was everyone's favorite level in Battlefront 2. Luke, also sensing Rosh's incompetence, sends him away on the easy task of looking at asteroids, which is something even Rosh couldn't mess up. Rosh hasn't returned. He's long overdue and we haven't heard from him. Oh, come on. Hoth is probably my least favorite level in Jedi Academy. The first part has us riding a tauntaun following a trail of growing lights. There are enemies you can fight along the way, but I recommend against it. There's no purpose in doing that, and it just slows you down in the long run. You do get to fight a yeti just like an empire, and you even kill it too by cutting off its arm just like Luke did in the movies. You go underground in Hoth and explore the tunnels of Echo Bays, the same place as in the movie as well. At the end of Hoth, we get to fight Ayla Secure's evil sister. She's just here in this game to serve for two boss fights, and that's it. Even from a gameplay perspective, Allure shows you how important it is to keep moving and utilizing terrain around you. If you break line of sight with her, Allura loses track of you and searches for you, even though she just saw Jaden run behind cover a few moments ago. Where have you gone? Where have you gone? We defeat her and she jumps away like a cat. If you haven't guessed by now, the antagonists of this game are your stereotypical Saturday morning villains. And Allura just serves as a tip of the iceberg when it comes to how silly these villains come across. We head back to Yavin 4 and tell Luke and Kyle what went down on Hoth. Rosh went missing on his last mission, but Luke tells us he's alive. Jaden gets promoted to the rank of Jedi Apprentice and gets sent out on the Act 2 missions, but not before getting a new lightsaber fighting style. We get the option between picking fast or strong style. Both give us new combos like this quick forward strike with the fast style. The main difference between the two is this, fast is better at defense, while strong is at offense. Since I was playing on the hardest difficulty, I chose the fast option to defend myself better. After choosing a preferred style, C-3PO greets us to Act 2's missions. The first planet on our list is Narkrita. Local hut crime wars have taken old people hostages and we need to save them. There's a catch though. The jail they're in has a rancor in it that devours the prisoners. Rancor? The guards here act like they're at the horse races, filling up on rum at the bar and taking bets on who gets eaten last. It all fits perfectly with the theme of the huts being criminal underlords. I love the opening too of this mission. It feels like the beginning of an episode of a television show. I hope that if there is a spiritual successor to this game, that it takes the format of a television show plot like Clone Wars. From a gameplay perspective, the level is very interesting. It's set up like a loop. You go in to clear the area of enemies, release the prisoners, and escort them to safety from the rampaging Rancor trying to get its next meal. We need to distract it away from the prisoners. You could fight it, but just be careful or you run the risk of getting eaten by it. You need to stay close to it because if you get too far away from it, the Rancor would just eat the prisoners instead of you. Which, from a design standpoint, is a really smart change. The player is a lot faster and more agile than Rancor is, and they can easily outrun it. But the prisoners aren't as mobile, so the player needs to constantly maintain his yo-yo effect on the Rancor. It's also on this mission where I discovered how acrobatic Jaden is now since Force Jump just got upgraded. We can wall run, scale walls and jump off them, do kick jumps off walls, and even wall jump too. It's like we're Super Mario. It's a sad day that these mechanics are never necessary to use in-game. That seems to be the trend of Jedi Academy. Great mechanics implemented into the gameplay, but were just never fully utilized in single player. The next level has us going to refueling platforms that suspended in orbit of the planet. Nothing too much to say here for this level on gameplay besides the fact this is the perfect place to be launching enemies to their death with force push. We also get introduced to my least favorite enemy type in this game, the jetpack troopers. God, they just stay out of distance from your lightsaber attacks and are constantly firing at you. I was only able to kill them by spamming force lightning. Thankfully, the next mission is my favorite one in the whole game. What's a Star Wars game if it doesn't have a speeder bike level? It's not a good one and I'll tell you that. It's one of the jankiest levels I've ever seen in a game, but oh my god is it hard to describe the enjoyment I had playing this. The speeder control is fine because the map is a linear track, you have enemies pursuing you trying to kill you from behind, you have lasers shooting at you, slow-mo close-ups of you jumping off cliffs, it honestly felt cinematic. Coruscant is up next in the rotation. We're sent here to arrest a mob boss for manufacturing illegal battle droids. 
I'll just briefly mention again how much I love the look of this place. Jedi Academy really sells you on the atmosphere. The layout of this area is something to take note of. We're placed right in front of where we need to be, but a dastardly villain has blown up the bridge getting to it. We must make our way across the bridge by doing some sick parkour, jumping from building to building to reach our goal. Elevation in this level plays a key role here. There are snipers on high ground that killed me a few times. I died more to these robots though with an electric field attack. They would just turn it on instantly and kill me in less than a second. You can try throwing your lightsaber at them, but 9 times out of 10, you'll watch your lightsaber casually fall into the streets below us. Enemies in Jedi Academy come in a lot of variety, from what weapons they're wielding, what type of movement they have, and if they can use the force. It gives the game a good sense of progression and difficulty curve. Stormtroopers for example start off with the E-11, then later get machine guns and shotguns. After Act 1, the Stormtroopers unlock Jetpack Troopers because that was their favorite class in Battlefront 2, and Power Armor Troopers. They're the most dangerous enemy in this whole game. They can kill Jaden in just two shots from their railgun. The AI of these enemies can be hit or miss. Usually, they'll just stay in place shooting at you. If you take cover, they'll come running towards you. They'll also run away from you if you get too close. Suffice to say, the AI in this game can appear to be quite smart at times, like this guy bouncing a grenade off the wall at me when I walk into the hallway. These might appear to be the AI making smart choices, but behind the curtains you'll find a developer giving them hacks. Take this for instance, if you try to shoot a rocket at the Sith cultist, he'll immediately force push it right back at you. The reaction from the Sith cultist is automatic, no matter how hard I try, he always deflects my projectiles. Please keep in mind that I'm only talking about the AI on the hardest difficulty. On lower difficulties, they might not be as reactive as they are on Jedi Grand Master difficulty. The last mission thankfully doesn't have any dark side users. We're tasked with investigating rumors of Imperials operating off of Dusun. Upon landing an exit, we're ambushed by the Imperials and forced to surrender. They toss us into prison. The leader of this facility makes a bargain with us. We need to escape the prison while he tries to hunt us down. He tells us all this while also trying to do his best Emperor Palpatine impression. Drop your laser sword, Jedi. Oh, my Jedi friend. What do you think of our accommodations? Oh, good. Good. This level has a unique gimmick of taking our lightsaber away and forcing us to use whatever guns we find. That's a major bummer since I can only describe the gunplay as mediocre. 1. Most of the weapons kinda suck since they're so inaccurate and 2. They don't have any real impact to them. You just shoot the bad man until one of you follows us over. There are exceptions with the rocket launcher and railgun. They are accurate and toss enemies away when getting hit by them. There's also a lot of impact and satisfaction crushing enemies with the ATST you can pile in this level as well. I recommend you use it to gun down the Palpatine impersonator or you're gonna get wrecked by his railgun. Don't worry, we'll soon get revenge against him for killing us so many times on this level. Jedi. <laughs> it's time for the longest mission in Jedi Academy, Vader's Castle. It's broken up into three different loading screens. First, you have the exterior of Vader's Castle with acid rain falling everywhere. We also have Kyle Katarn accompanying us on this mission. The second level of Vader's Castle takes us into the interior where there's some puzzles to be solved. There's a room filled with water. Electrical wire will fall into it, causing the water to electrify. And kill both Kyle and Jaden. You must use force pull on these pumps here to drain the water. But I didn't even notice them at all initially. The game hasn't needed the player to observe their environment around them for a puzzle since back at the sand crawler. It's my fault for not noticing the pumps at first, instead of just trying to jump along the electrical wire and killing myself multiple times. I just wish the developers implemented more instances of the player needing to solve puzzles by interacting with the environment. There's another force pull puzzle coming soon. We have to redirect these mirrors towards the machine. Once we redirect them all, the thing blows up and knocks Kyle Katarn off this ledge. Okay. This scene is weird. When I first saw this, I thought he palmed it to his death considering his gut-wrenching scream. But two seconds later, he's chatting Jaden up like nothing happened. Why not just have the same conversation but later in the level during gameplay? A simple audio playing would have been less work to implement than animating this scene.
it would have also added in suspense for us. We're now alone in this place, surrounded by hostile forces. It would have been a great build-up for when Jaden confronts Rosh at the end of this level. I have a few nitpicks here on what happens. Why did Rosh join the dark side? From his dialogue with Jaden, he says that he did it for more power since Kyle was holding him back. Which is great, it's what the game has been foreshadowing with Rosh since all the way back in the beginning. Rosh wants to be the most powerful Jedi there ever was, just like Anakin Skywalker did. Then, when Jaden tells Rosh he's a Jedi, Rosh gets confused. Rosh, what are you saying? You're a Jedi. No. No, I... ENOUGH TALK! Like, he's just been brainwashed and is trying to resist the brainwash controlling him. The answer has to do with this staff Rosh holds in his hand. This staff is the same staff that's been sucking up all the Force energy. That's what we saw during the intro cutscene. The reason why they're doing all this is to resurrect a long dead Sith Lord, Ragnos. Ragnos had a staff he aptly named the Staff of Ragnos that he gave to Tavion. This chick right here just like she belongs in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Your petty friendship cannot compare with the power of the dark side. So is this She's the leader of all the Sith cultists we've been fighting, plus Alora. Tavion wants to resurrect her long dead Sith master Ragnos. Anyone who wields the staff of Ragnos gets their power increase, but with the downside of having Ragnos influence the wielder's mind. Tying this back to Rosh, he's holding the staff, therefore he is being controlled by Ragnos. Jaden breaks Ragnos' control over Rosh only for a moment before Ragnos tightens the string again on his puppet. Because when we next see Rosh, he doesn't have the staff and is apologetic to Jaden for turning to the dark side. We defeat Rosh, but not before he turns into the Flash. Kyle comes running into the room and Tavion zaps both Jaden and Kyle. Kyle and Tavion have a cat fight with each other because they dated back in high school. Don't ask, it's complicated. Tavion runs away with Rosh and we lose our lightsaber in the collapsing rubble, forcing us to build a new lightsaber. You get the option between dual wielding sabers or just having a staff saber. The dual sabers provide you with more DPS while the staff saber focuses on mobility. It also replaces your inaccurate saber throw with the kick. Oh, you can also stick with a single lightsaber and have all three fighting styles, fast, medium, heavy. But don't waste your time with that unless your favorite character is Count Dooku in Battlefront 2. Luke tells us to go complete the Act 3 missions. First on the list is the Jedi Tomb. This level has the best opening of any mission for this. I like this level for its verticality. You must descend into this doom by jumping down rocks and over destroyed bridges. Act 3 is when the game starts to ramp up its difficulty by throwing its best enemies at you. Dark side users are a lot more aggressive and are more spammy with their force abilities. The end of this area has a cool set piece of us having to escape this underground tomb before it collapses on top of us. Next up, the planet Tanab, or as have I gotten to know it as, the Rancor Race. For this whole mission, you have to keep away from this giant mutated Rancor, or he was going to eat you. The Rancor does a great job at keeping up with Jaden. You're not even safe while inside. The level ends when we crush the Rancor against a ray shield. I have mixed feelings for the next planet, Yolara. The level has us going through a stone tower along the cliffside. I love the background of this location. It gives a good sense of how high up we are, which fits the theme of this level of elevation. It's the antithesis of the Jedi Tomb. That level had you diving underground while this level had you climb the top of a tower. What I dislike about this level are the unique enemies encountered here. These guys are the native aliens are equipped with guns that shoot poison. These bullets leave a cloud of poison whenever they land, and these poison clouds deal crazy damage to Jaden. Lucky for us, the native aliens also don't like the Imperials and will try to kill them too throughout the level. So you'll see them battling around. This stands out in Act 3 as the only mission to not have any Sith cultists. It's just stormtroopers. It also fills up the third law of Star Wars of having the protagonist of the story escape from an Imperial base. The last mission of Act 3 is what I would consider the second most boring level in Jedi Academy, which is quite a shame considering Boba Fett shows up in it. Boba chases us through this ruined city while we must plant multiple bombs to destroy this ancient historical site. The mission is boring because Boba Fett can't do anything to us unless he's right up in front of our face. Even at the end of this level, we're forced to fight him and completely just decimate him. If you try to kill him before this part, he just flies away for a little bit. The main gimmick of this level is cool, 
but it's placed too late into the story of the game. This should have been an Act 2 mission, and a speeder bike mission could have taken its place in Act 3. That wraps up the 5 missions for Act 3. Sorry if I seem to skim past them, but there's not much to go over in these levels that I haven't already covered about the game. Luke calls us back to the Jedi Temple. He informs us that Tavion is going to go resurrect Ragnos. Before we head out to go stop her, Kyle is like, Hey Jaden, let's go rescue your friend, Rosh. Which leads us to go to confront Rosh. Here is our true climax level of Jedi Academy. You will be fighting cultists after cultists for over a half hour in this level. It's great. There's cliffs to kick people off of, power armor troops coming after you. It just feels awesome to cut them all down. You just feel so powerful. At the end of our killing spree, we face Rosh. Oh, and Alora is here too for her boss fight. Here's where Jedi Academy gives you the choice of being a Jedi or a Sith Lord. Do you save or kill Rosh? Your choice here dictates how the final level is. If you choose Jedi, you fight just Sith cultists. However, if you choose to be a Dark Lord of the Sith instead, Jaden causes the second Jedi purge to happen in the last level. Rosh has tried to kill us on more than just one occasion, so I'm assuming most people chose to kill him here on their first time. Jaden fully embraces the power of the dark side. Alora says welcome to the team, and Jaden calls her useless. We kill her and go to claim the staff of Ragnos on the planet of Korriban. The best reason to choose this path is because Jaden starts to talk in a more aggressive voice and that you just need to listen to. Scepter of Ragnos is too powerful to be left in the hands of someone as weak as Tavion. If anything, it should belong to me! <laughs> oh, you think so? You, on the other hand, are useless. I will pass, whether you want me to or not. Don't get in my way, Kyle! Oh no, this is just the beginning. If you choose light side, Jaden forgives Rosh and still fights Alora. After we defeat her, we save Rosh's life and head to Korriban. Korriban as a final level is okay. You begin the level inside some ruins with some light platforming. There's lightsaber wielders everywhere here too. The second part of the level takes place outdoors in this ruined desert temple. The opening shot of this place is something out of a movie or reminiscent of Fallout 3 to a degree. You get the feeling that there's a massive battle going on here. For navigation, you need to push some obelisks to make a bridge across some chasms. A cool mechanic that I wish was used more throughout the rest of the game. We reach the end and confront Tavion. If you're going down the dark side path, then Jaden tells her that he's going to kill her. Tavion fights like every other Sith cultist. She has two unique attacks, this laser beam that instantly kills me, and an AoE knockback. Once we defeat her, Jaden kills her. Now, the real final boss enters. Kyle, Katarn, our old master. Kyle is different from other force wielders since he can use both light side and dark side powers. He also has this cool punch attack he does. But inevitably, we prove to be too much to him and just blast him with this laser, leaving Kyle in the dust. Jaden leaves to become the new Kylo Ren in the end cutscene for this path. If you're doing the Jedi Knight path, then Jaden doesn't kill Tavion. Instead, once we defeat her, a cutscene plays. Not cower as I did before Katarn. I shall not be denied. By the Force. Marka Ragnos. <gasps> A mere Jedi child will not undo my return. What is this? <laughs> is this supposed to be a Lich from Baldur's Gate? He looks nothing like any Force ghost in previous media. Why did they make him look like this? Anyway, the Scooby-Doo ghost possesses Tavion and she gets a sick katana. Like, she just activated Devil Trigger. She's a lot more challenging in his phase and stronger than Kyle Katarn. She gets new combos, a homing sword projectile, and AoE life drain attacks. She took me a few attempts mostly to the fact that she would destroy me in saber clashes. Eventually, after many reloads, we take her down and get treated to the epilogue. <laughs> No! This 
is impossible. I will return, Jedi. One day, I shall return and annihilate you all! Thank you both. There's still a galaxy full of trouble out there. Are you ready for another mission? Oh no! Cue end credits after a cheesy, heartful ending befitting of Star Wars. That's Jedi Academy, a great game that just needed a bit more polish. It has a generic Star Wars story, but it's a Star Wars game, so it's passable. Because Jedi Academy lets you experience what no other game has been able to replicate since, letting you feel like you're a Jedi.